very much, uh, Luan, for the kind introduction and for the very kind uh, invitation to share with you some pharmacology, but some pharmacology in uh, the context of uh, biomedical engineering. And uh, I too uh, wish to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So, uh, when I started my career, uh, these kinds of disclosure slides uh, weren't used, but uh, now they're very important so that uh, you can understand my uh, various conflicts of interest and interests uh, through the funding uh, that's received by the laboratory and by our, our research group. So, uh, we have a number of industry partners in the ARC Centre for Personalised Therapeutics Technologies and have received uh, either currently or in the past uh, funding from a number of uh, pharma companies, uh, as well as a number of competitive agencies. A and I serve as the Chief Scientific Officer and Board Member of a new University of Melbourne uh, spin-out biotech. I, I have to be uh, a little bit discreet about the name of it because we're waiting for our uh, partners to make a formal announcement of that enterprise. So, uh, here's uh, what's to come. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, new drug registrations, uh, cost and efficiency. I'm going to go back in time to think about champions for uh, drug development and drug discovery. We'll look at some recent impacts of engineering on drug discovery, uh, return to a theme that's very current in my laboratory, uh, looking at modulating the clock, the circadian rhythm, to influence inflammation and fibrosis. And I'll finish uh, with some comments uh, on where the state of the art is with human on a chip. So new drug approvals are flatlining, and this is the, the most recent data available for approvals in 2019. And maybe there's a slight increase in, in the biologicals. These are the non-small molecules, and I've put a typical biological agent here being a, a monoclonal antibody. Uh, and so these are the most common protein therapeutics. So these require a biological license application to, for registration. Uh, and the, the pale blue uh, indicates new medical, uh, new molecular entities. These are small molecules, and here's one of my favorites. It's uh, caffeine. So we have a relatively modest number of really new drugs approved each year. And this hasn't increased over the last uh, 20, 25 years in, in terms of the, uh, the success rate, whereas the investment uh, has increased very dramatically. So the cost of each new drug is rising. Now here's the uh, Tufts uh, um, Centre for uh, Study of Drug Discovery estimate, uh, the most recent estimate of what it costs to produce a drug. And the figure here uh, is 2.6 billion, and this is in uh, 2013 US dollars. Uh, this was a fairly rigorous study of the drug development costs. Uh, the, the paper extensively explored uh, the randomised selection of particular uh, drugs from a large sample from a significant number of different pharmaceutical companies. And one of the reasons why the number is so high is that it includes the successes and the failures. And as you may well be aware, there are many more failures than successes. The other reason that it's a very high cost is uh, the cost of money over time. So the typical development times are 12 to 16 years. And of course, if the money's been invested in drug development, then it hasn't been invested in something else. And that uh, means that there is a time cost of the finance. So you can see here um, the total cost of the development uh, comprising that time cost of money. Uh, plus the actual costs. And it's worth noting that the, the amount that's required uh, to get a drug to the end of the preclinical phase, the pre-human phase, uh, exceeds the combined budget of National Health Medical Research Council and the Medical Research uh, Future Fund. And so it is an exceptionally expensive business. How do you drive this process? Well, I think there there's been lots of evidence for champions, but I should start at the beginning, and I think uh, uh, the indigenous peoples are the real uh, champions of drug discovery because early people, when uh, finding themselves in need of treatment, experiment. 
and we're naturally curious. And so with that curiosity and, and much time for experimentation, there have been refinements in the Materia Medica that uh, collect information about the uh, oral traditions and the, the empirical knowledge that uh, has been gained from experimenting with plants and even animal extracts. So this is uh, known as ethnopharmacology. It's an understanding of the medicinal use of various extracts, uh, including microorganisms and minerals. So many valuable drugs have come from uh, these uh, self-experimentation, uh, or what I, I like to refer to as human bioassay e experiments. And here we've got one which is rather uh, attractive uh, flower, uh, being uh, the source of the um, uh, digoxin, which is used to treat uh, cardiac failure. Of course, these agents that are extracted from biological sources often uh, form now the starting point for further development where uh, the agents can be optimised for the use rather than uh, simply accepting what nature has produced. So that's human bioassay by experimentation. Here's uh, the origin of scientific uh, bioassay. Uh, and it really starts with Paul Ehrlich in the 19th century uh, coming from a strong interest uh, in chemistry in, in Germany uh, and looking at the way that uh, the stains interacted with tissues, uh, understanding that there was something specific about the way that different molecules could stain different parts of tissues. So some uh, specific sites on cells uh, that might be influenced by uh, the uh, uh, stains, but also uh, influenced in the function of the cells. And so he's credited with the introduction of this lock and key concept where the drug interacts with a very specific site and is able to unlock the gate and have uh, effects subsequently. And so this is a, a very uh, important notion in pharmacology and a great milestone uh, for the development of the understanding of the way that drugs exert their effects on cells. Here's another important experiment. This is by uh, Otto Lovey, uh, looking at the electrical stimulation of the heart and being able to uh, detect the chemical that's released from that electrical stimulation in a donor uh, preparation and then subsequently being able to show that that's effect of that uh, uh, released material could be blocked uh, by a specific antagonist in, in, in this uh, particular experiment, it's atropine. And so this is amongst the first of the uh, uses of bioassay in a systematic manner to identify the way that uh, an endogenously released substance following nerve activation can influence the heart cells. So we'll take the clock forward to 2011 and here is a, an image that really excited me when I saw it for the first time and still does now, actually, having played it many times subsequently. It's a simulation over a period of five microseconds. Not five milliseconds, five microseconds. So it's, no, it's much shorter than that. Uh, it's a vanishingly short uh, uh, period of time. And what it's showing is a small molecule, and that's the, the yellow molecule, it's mostly yellow, and, and it's... Uh, uh, floating around above the receptor, but uh, it starts to engage with the receptor, it touches various parts of the receptor, and it's finding its way down into, into the, the cleft where it's going to spend some time. It's going to actually uh, somewhat stably bind uh, to that part of the protein, which is embedded in the membrane. You can see the membrane uh, sitting around it here, and the colour scheme here indicates the amount of time that the small molecule is spending in different... Uh, parts of the cell membrane as it's approaching the binding of the receptor. So we go from a lock and key uh, representation to uh, a, an understanding which is uh, based on the understanding of the structure of the receptor uh, and also on uh, the high computing power uh, that's been required to generate even just this very short period of uh, simulation of both the small molecule and its target. So this is a very important new tool uh, that's conferred on the uh, discipline by very specific uh, supercomputers which have been purpose built for this particular type of simulation. On the right hand side here you can see another of the modern tools which is a, a crystal structure 
of a target. Uh, it happens to be casein kinase, a target of interest to our uh, research group. And here is a small molecule fitting into the cleft. And most of the uh, drug receptor interactions that we uh, know of do represent the interaction of a small molecule with a cleft in a protein, a pocket. And, and this confers some uh, special uh, requirements on the drug development. Oftentimes, uh, the drug might have to be somewhat hydrophobic to bind uh, to this uh, site. That is, it's shy of water. So I should stop playing this uh, simulation, even though it is intriguing to watch, and return to the need for a program champion. And here's an old champion, uh, Hippocrates. And uh, Hippocrates is accorded recognition of the benefits of the extract, the juices of the poplar tree and the willow for pain in childbirth uh, and fever. And here is the, the weeping willow. Uh, we, we take the clock forward uh, uh, 2,000 years or thereabouts to this letter from uh, the Reverend Edmund Stone of uh, Oxfordshire uh, to the President of the Royal Society. Um, I'll, I'll read this bit because I, I think some of you at the back may not be able to see it. I have no other motives for publishing this valuable specific than that it may have a fair and full trial in all its variety of circumstances and situations and that the world may reap the benefits accruing from it. Uh, for these purposes, I've given this long and minute account of it and, and which I would not have troubled your lordship with was I not fully persuaded of the wonderful efficacy of this cortex selectness in agues and intermittent cases and I, did I not think that the, this persuasion was sufficiently supported by the manifold experience uh, which I have had of it. And this preceded a, a five-page treatise on the benefits of uh, the extract of the willow bark. Um, I do like to show this to students because of the particular style of communication. Uh, the Reverend was in fear of the, uh, the President of the Royal Society. Uh, so he says, I am, my Lord, with the profoundest submission and respect your Lordship's most obedient, humble servant, Edward Stone, um, which contrasts with the email style that we have today. Hey there. <laughs> so uh, another champion. Um, th this surprised me a little bit. Precision medicine in the 1930s. We think of precision medicine as having arrived at the time of the, uh, the understanding of the human genome uh, and uh, the revelation of uh, its sequence. But actually, uh, the Brits have claimed precision medicine in 1930s. So here it is. It's even got a, a name that reflects the empire, emperor uh, for aspirin. And it's a British weapon of precision against pain um, and a, a number of other uh, conditions. So here. Uh, we're looking at uh, crystals of aspirin, the, the uh, compound that's being uh, championed, and it's further championed by the marketing department. So uh, there are uh, a good number of claims here. Testimonials, great for a sore throat. Uh, you can't beat aspro for colds. Uh, but here is something that's a, a bit troubling. Uh, aspro, uh, how to give aspro to the kiddies. Well, uh, because it's now known that aspro should not be given to the kiddies. That, uh, in fact, aspirin uh, causes uh, a rare syndrome called Reyes syndrome with low frequency, but it's a devastating syndrome, and so uh, aspirin is contraindicated in children. So not everything uh, of these uh, marketing departments can be relied upon. So aspirin's mechanism of action was discovered uh, in the 1960s, published in 1971 by Sir John Vane. Uh, and he won the Nobel Prize for this. And uh, I've included a, a photograph, not a good photograph, but a photograph of my a former mentor, uh, Professor Priscilla Piper, who worked with John Vane on these cascades. These are uh, systems to be able to measure the responses of a number of tissues in series. So this is a very old style bioassay. And this was the kind of apparatus with which John Vane identified the mechanism of action of aspirin. And uh, I joined Priscilla somewhat later than this period of time uh, for a postdoc on prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and platelet activating factor. And it was a lot of fun. So back to the drug discovery theme. And he here's the uh, linear uh, development of a, a drug from therapeutic concept through target identification and validation 
uh, screening process, lead identification, lead optimization. This then is a, a drug candidate. It hasn't gone into a human yet. So that's the standard uh, process. What we've seen thus far is a championship for uh, human curiosity driving uh, to the recognition of salicylates as having benefit and then some medicinal chemistry uh, to actually improve the potency of the compound by acetylating the salicylate to form aspirin. But I'm going to turn your attention to a different example now, and this uh, is generated not through curiosity, well, actually it's not true, it, it almost certainly is generated through curiosity, but curiosity driven not by personal experimentation but by clinical and biological insights. And this comes from the idea of getting a better aspirin, and this idea was current in the late 80s. And uh, for it, you need to appreciate that there's good enzyme, good COX, and bad COX. And uh, the good COX is needed for uh, the actions of the prostaglandins on platelets and on the stomach. So there's protective effects of the prostaglandins that are produced through this COX-1 pathway. Aspirin blocks the COX-1 and it also blocks uh, COX-2. So the bad COX generates an excess of prostaglandins and these affect uh, neural tissue and also affect the immune system and have effects which uh, make uh, contribution to pain and inflammation and so these effects need to be blocked. So the idea for a better aspirin was to block the bad COX and leave the good COX to do its beneficial job. And this was triggered by uh, this fellow, Philip Needleman, uh, who in 1988 uh, discovered uh, cyclooxygenase 2, COX-2, and uh, three years later, the enzyme was cloned, and in an extraordinary short amount of time, the discovery was converted into a drug on the market, celecoxib. Uh, a selective COX-2 inhibitor, and it grossed 1.5 billion in its first year. And the, one of the reasons why this development was so rapid is there was an obvious difference uh, upon crystallization of the cyclooxygenase 1 and the cyclooxygenase 2. There's an obvious difference in the cleft, this pocket, where uh, in this case the substrate for production of prostaglandins, the, the precursor substance into which uh, is converted uh, to prostaglandins, uh, fits. And that uh, pocket is much smaller in the COX-1 than the COX-2. So it was possible for the medicinal chemists to design molecules uh, that would fit into the COX-2 and block the bad COX and to be excluded from this narrower pocket in COX-1. And so this was achieved in, in a remarkably short period of time. However, the story didn't end well. So here, uh, one of the ideas was that the uh, ulcerative effects of the uh, COX uh, IBS, the, the so-called COX-2 selective versions of aspirin, uh, would be much safer for uh, patients who were at risk of ulcer formation. And this initial data at six months uh, did align with that expectation. Fewer ulcer symptoms, fewer ulcer complications in the patients who were treating silicoxib. Uh, at a dose which gave equivalent control for uh, rheumatoid arthritis symptoms uh, by comparison with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This is a blanket term that also includes aspirin. But that's at six months. Uh, the trial actually continued on for 12 months and the difference seen at six months uh, was not observed at 12 months. So this was only a delay in the ulcer symptoms, not, not necessarily a, a suppression uh, of the same significance as suggested by the six-month data. Worse than that, though, with longer trials of the COX-2 inhibitor, it became evident that there were an excess of cardiovascular events, that is, stroke and heart attack. And so here's the rofecoxib, which has now been taken off the market, and celecoxib, which shows a dose-related increase in the number of these cardiovascular events. Curiously, this took some time to appear. So if you, if you look at the placebo, which is this light grey line, you can see that they track the same until about 18 months. And uh, similarly here, about 12 months before there starts to be a difference. And this is a little bit unusual uh, in terms of adverse effects to have such a long latency to the appearance 
of an impact. But it's been uh, well confirmed and it has led to a limitation in the range of indications for celecoxib. So, on to the main theme, now that you've had a little bit of an orientation to uh, some curiosity-driven uh, drug discovery and some structure-based uh, drug design and development. And let's look at uh, the impact of engineering. And this, this image is one that uh, I witnessed uh, in 1990. At, uh, I was very fortunate to visit the Takeda Chemical uh, Laboratories in Osaka. Uh, and saw a robotic system for drug screening. Um, and uh, whilst it was well established at that time, it's taken a lot longer uh, for academic institutions to obtain access to this uh, very expensive technology. This is a paper from the Scripps Research Institute in 2010, uh, suggesting that academics could take part in this process of drug discovery uh, through high throughput screening. And here's the agency of the high throughput. These are these uh, very densely populated uh, plates. They've got very many wells on them uh, where the drug substance can be added uh, to either a cellular system or to a target in order to measure an effect. And so it is that uh, the Walter Eliza Hall Institute has uh, uh, had uh, installed a very significant suite of equipment uh, known as the National Drug Discovery Centre and offering at a, a relatively modest uh, cost to academics the opportunity to screen for new chemicals uh, to bind to their particular uh, target of interest. So it's a really exciting time in Melbourne to have access uh, to this particular technology. So how does it work? Well, the Compounds are held in a library, and the particular paper that uh, this uh, image is drawn from was looking for inhibitors of uh, malaria, and looking in particular for uh, the inhibition of this beta hematin, which, which is a waste uh, product of the consumption of hemoglobin by the malaria parasite. So it's eating, eating all the protein in the red blood cells, and this releases a lot of heme, and the heme is toxic, so it has to be uh, detoxified by conjugation. And if that's inhibited, then that's going to kill the parasite. And so this experiment was to look for inhibitors. It is the needle in the haystack, so you may have to explore uh, 100,000, 300,000, a million compounds uh, to find just a few hits. And so these, these are the real gold in the system. So you need an assay, you need um, then to examine uh, what level of activity you have across the range of hits. And in this particular experiment, they were quite stringent, only taking uh, compounds that gave more than 80% inhibition of the formation of the detoxified form of heme. Uh, and they had a group of about 10 compounds that gave 100% inhibition. So this is a, a, a very fortunate high throughput screen in terms of its yield. And it then takes the, the investigators into this uh, lead identification and lead optimization uh, stage of the process where the hit becomes the starting point. And here we see a number of scaffolds that were drawn from that screen. And the medicinal chemists pour over these scaffolds to see which ones might be most amenable uh, to adaptation, to improve the solubility, to increase the persistence to increase the potency. So typically the drug doesn't come from this high throughput screen. There's much further work to do. And it's exemplified in this loop here. It's not the same molecule, but it gives you the idea. So if you, if you look at the molecule, it, it's a um, steroid-like uh, molecule with an expanded ring here. And it's got a number of R groups. And R here represents a place on the molecule where the medicinal chemist will seek to substitute a variety of functional groups in order to change the properties of the molecule. And we go around this, this loop quite a number of times where medicinal chemistry generates new molecules. They go into our assays and we measure how potent they are, how soluble they are, and a number of other features, and then keep going round and round and round until we know enough to make some models. And here are some uh, models. These are uh, so-called quantitative structure activity relationship uh, based models. The yellow indicates uh, the um, disfavored size, and, and I'll go back to this one. Here's dealing with the charge, so the blue favors positive charge, and the, 
the red uh, favors negative uh, charge. So both charge and size can be optimized in a series of modifications of the uh, molecule in order to optimize uh, the property. So that, that process uh, now gets one closer to identifying a compound that might be ready for uh, preclinical pharmacology, that is the safety and the toxicology uh, testing that occurs before the first time in human. Now, uh, I want to discuss another uh, piece of technology that's had a really big impact. The robotics have had enormous impact, but so too uh, have these particular high content screening instruments. So they, their advent was around the 2000 uh, when uh, these instruments were uh, really revolutionary, offering confocal microscopy, that is the very thin slices through the uh, material of interest to get high resolution images. But now they're used in high content uh, screening. And that high content screening is uh, shown here in diagrammatic form where the experiment has been to expose epithelial cells to extracts of various um, of these uh, uh, liquids uh, that are uh, volatilized uh, in e-cigarettes uh, and compare those with tobacco aerosol to look at the impact on the shape and the uh, size of the epithelial cells. And these high content screening instruments are able to segment the cells, count the cells, and measure structural features of the cells, even features that can't be recognized by a human poring over the images for a very long period of time. These features can be extracted uh, mathematically uh, from inspecting a large number of cells and be used uh, to explore the impacts of, in this case, nicotine and, and some of the other volatile uh, components that are generated upon uh, the burning of these liquids. On the uh, right here, we see uh, a live cell imaging experiment, also uh, supported by these high content screening uh, systems, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to recognize that these cells at the top, the control cells, are somewhat rounded, and they're, they like each other's company, whereas the, the cells at the bottom, they're spindle-shaped, they're long and thin, and they tend not uh, to uh, congregate with each other. And so this is a, a very typical uh, formation of a fibroblast from an epithelial uh, precursor, we call it an epithelial mesenchymal transition, or EMT is much easier uh, to say. And this is an important event in cancer uh, where some epithelial cancers uh, can acquire the capacity to invade tissue uh, and uh, to go on to metastasize through the EMT process. So it's a process that we like to be able to uh, quantitate by measuring the shape features of the cell and comparing them to reference cells. And so you've seen the banner uh, and heard how difficult it is to pronounce the name of this centre. It's the ARC, Centre for Personalised Therapeutics Technologies, uh, or CPTT. And it was really uh, driven by uh, those observations that I made earlier uh, around the costs of drug development, but also the rate of failure. And this is a, a review from 2014, uh, which has really focused in on the phase two failures. This is the time of proof of concept of a drug. So it's not a large population trial, but it might be 100 patients to 300 patients, and it's the point at which you find out whether the drug actually works, does its therapeutic job in a limited number of patients of a particular select type. And AstraZeneca were uh, reviewing the literature at large and uh, highlighting that actually 90% or more of uh, the drugs were failing in phase 2b, this uh, critical, pivotal uh, trial stage, because they lacked efficacy. They didn't work. And so this really uh, behooves us to explore what are the reasons why uh, there's such a high rate of failure. And I think the very obvious thing to say is that it appears that the predictions from the earlier work haven't been very reliable. Too many compounds are moving through this stage. So Astra uh, um, identified the five R's, target, patient, tissue, safety, commercial potential, because sometimes uh, the 
compounds don't progress because of commercial reasons, and the right culture. And they're talking about uh, the, the culture of the, the teams that are working on, on the, the discoveries. But we think that uh, the culture systems are also an important uh, element to be considered, and here they are considered. So the problem stated is that uh, more than 50% of drug candidates in phase two clinical trial are not effective, and we can uh, just regard this as a failure to fail. What's it cost? 10 to $50 million each time it occurs, and lost opportunity. And I mentioned culture, so uh, much of uh, the center's work is done on cell culture. Uh, there are different philosophies of medical research, and uh, some tend to use cell culture and human cells in culture, and others tend to, to use animal experimentation. And uh, here we're looking at different approaches to using human cells in culture. And so we want to uh, move away from the traditional uh, two-dimensional stiff environments and use three-dimensional structures. We want to change the period over which the drug actions are examined to reflect the actions of the drug when it's subject to clinical trials so that we get stronger predictive value. And we need to model the kinetics because the kinetics don't happen like they do when a robot adds a, a single uh, shot of the drug into a cell system. The kinetics are variable because humans handle the drug variably and depending on the way that the drug's administered, there can be very dramatic differences in the profile of exposure of the cells to the drug. So this is important to consider in thinking about improving these in vitro systems uh, to avoid this failure to fail. And so I'm going to talk about uh, microfluidic uh, chips because they're starting to revolutionise uh, this space. And the uh, sequence, the workflow on the left-hand side will be uh, perhaps familiar to you uh, from the processes that are making uh, standard silicon uh, wafer chips for electronics. But uh, this is making a, a negative, and this negative goes further into the process uh, of soft lithography. So one, once you have a, a negative of the uh, channel structure that you, you wish to make, uh, then uh, this material polydimethylsilane is poured over uh, the negative and then it's uh, demolded after it's uh, solidified uh, to reveal these micro channels, less than a millimetre uh, in uh, diameter and in depth. And uh, one can fabricate uh, ports in, in the material as well so that you can attach uh, the um, ports to uh, perfusion systems in order to have fluid flowing through the microfluidics. And uh, Brian Gow, who, who is the postdoc, uh, in the ARC centre uh, has simulated the flow through one of these uh, chips where we've got a, a, a uh, swelling down here where tissue, uh, micro tissue can be mounted to be uh, exposed to the fluid that's flowing across. So this is a, this is a micro uh, fluidic chip. We're really inspired by work at the Wies Institute uh, with Don Ingber and others. Uh, they first made and reported uh, lung on a chip in 2010. Uh, it took them another six years to make an airway on a chip, so this is uh, no uh, simple undertaking, uh, and they've met, had many hundreds of millions of uh, US dollars in funding uh, to drive this uh, forward and done very exciting things with the, the microfluidics uh, chip systems. So uh, this is one of the inspirational starts in this field. The other comes from Roger Cam, uh, uh, who works at the Mechanobiology Institute at the National University of Singapore, and he's made a version of tumour on a chip. So this is uh, endothelial cells, these are the cells that line blood vessels, placed into uh, a fibrin glue. So this is made from the coagulation pro proteins in the plasma, so it's a fairly straightforward process. And the finding is that the uh, lining cells, the endothelial cells, make tubes. And the tubes can connect uh, to the ports uh, in these microfluidic devices such that you can uh, pour or uh, perfuse under pressure tumour cells through the network of capillaries that's formed uh, sp spontaneously. And what you see on the right-hand side here is a model of metastasis where the red stain tumour cell 
is travelling uh, through the microvessel, but it starts to migrate out of the vessel uh, and into the surrounding uh, fibrin matrix. Uh, and this process is analogous to a tumour cell in the microcirculation finding its way into a target a tissue where it might uh, generate a metastatic growth. So this is one aspect of metastasis that can be modelled in a microfluidic environment. And of course, there, there are a number of others. So our centre uh, is also uh, building uh, devices. And uh, one of our particular interests is shown here in this, in this panel. Uh, it's a multi-well plate. And the cells have a reporter for the circadian clock. And so that reporter causes the well to light up periodically. So we, we're looking at the 24-hour cycles of the well becoming bright and then going dark again. And uh, it's our view that this particular aspect of cell physiology has been overlooked in many of the experiments so far in cell culture because the cells uh, either have no rhythm or they are asynchronous. They're all over the place. And uh, what we have devised is a method for synchronising the cells in the cell cycle. Uh, and uh, this is uh, replicating how these cells are in situ, in the body. Uh, it comes as a bit of surprise, perhaps, that all our cells are under cell cycle. We tend to think just of the brain cells as being influenced by uh, light exposure. and All of us have had some jet lag at one time or another and know uh, how much of an impact that can have on our, on our well-being. Well, it is the case that all cells in the body that have so far been investigated show this rhythm and uh, it needs to be taken into account in these experiments. There are other... Uh, devices that are being made. This is a, a microfluidic device that is uh, transmitting uh, sound waves into solution to exert a pressure on cells that allows the mechanics of the cells to be probed. So the level of compressibility. And, and this particular image uh, on the right-hand side is another measure of cell mechanics where uh, the cell can be drawn into a channel by a pressure difference. And by knowing the relationship between pressure and displacement, one can understand the stiffness of that particular cell. And this can be done at a relatively high throughput, which is not currently feasible. So there are a number of initiatives in our centre uh, directed along these lines. I want to return uh, to drug discovery and development to share with you a, a very exciting uh, development for uh, patients with uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, the new uh, Vertex uh, drug combination called Trikafta, uh, a combination of uh, these two agents, which work on this defective channel to increase the expression level of the plasma membrane of the cell. They've been combined with another agent called Ivacafta, which makes it more likely that the channel will open. The problem in cystic fibrosis is that this CFTR channel, as it's called, the chloride uh, transmission channel, is um, mutated and dysfunctional. So it can be dysfunctional in not getting to the membrane, and when it's there, it's dysfunctional in allowing ions to pass uh, through. Of course, uh, this new medication comes at an extraordinary price, 311000 uh, US dollars. And so it would be very important to identify which patients this particular medication or combination of drugs uh, is going to work in. But I want to draw on this example because actually the uh, champion in this particular drug development, the original champion, is the Cystic Fibrosis uh, Foundation. Uh, and they uh, funded the early work of the initial company that started to develop Ivacafta, uh, and uh, subsequently this was taken over by uh, Vertex, and they've developed the, this uh, range of agents that can be uh, delivered in various combinations. Here's uh, a little bit of bioengineering, uh, and it uses organoids. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background first. So here's the CFTR and it, it transports uh, chloride ions, and as it does transport chloride ions onto the surface of the cells, so water follows, and there's a, an adequate layer of water over the epithelium. But in patients with the defective CFTR, the water level falls, 
and this means that the cilia in the airways are uh, much less effective at moving mucus because the mucus falls down on the cilia and provides a resistance. And so this is part of the pathology that happens uh, in this particular condition. Uh, the uh, work at, uh, in the Netherlands at Leiden uh, has developed an assay for the function of this channel in it. It's an organoid swelling bioassay whereby uh, the response of the defective channel to a particular provocative agent called forscolone can be measured in the presence and absence of one of these channel correcting drugs. And you see uh, here in, in stylized form uh, that uh, in a patient who isn't responsive to the drug, there's no swelling. And in one who is swelling can be observed, and it can be observed quite quickly. So in, in 10 minutes, uh, you can uh, barely see a lumen at, uh, before the, the drug combination is added, but by 10 minutes, there's quite a large lumen, and the area occupied by the organoid has uh, increased considerably. And so this is a bioassay, a one at a time, of a particular uh, drug response. And when you consider how much uh, this particular agent uh, costs, even treating for a short period of time is going to be uh, an impost on the health system uh, for an agent that's not likely to have uh, any beneficial effect in that particular patient because the drug combination doesn't work on the particular mutations that, that they have. And so uh, this assay is now being used in the Netherlands uh, uh, to measure drug response and it actually is dependent on um, rectal biopsy, so it's the, the lining cells of the rectum which form these organoids and the reason that it's the rectum and not the airways is that it's a much safer clinical procedure, especially for infants in whom this uh, uh, condition is first diagnosed. So these, these organoids are exposed to the uh, drugs and allowed to swell and then the image analysis is able to quantitate how much of a swelling occurred to the various drug combinations in order to validate this very expensive therapy for particular patient subgroups. So an exciting development in the use of organoids. I'd like to share with you another uh, development in the field of personalised therapeutics technologies, and this comes from Singapore, uh, from the work of Ram Das Gupta and others. It's a work in progress, so there are clinical trials uh, being conducted to explore uh, the utility of this approach. But in essence, it involves taking a patient-derived culture and assessing the response of that culture to chemotherapy. As you will know, uh, in different patients, some chemotherapy uh, works and some does not. And in the same patient, uh, over time, some of the chemotherapy uh, that worked originally uh, fails uh, to have therapeutic effect. And so it's possible to take this biopsy of the culture, grow the cells in vitro, and assess the effects of a range of different types of chemotherapy to determine in real time what the choice uh, is available to the oncologist of a particular treatment regimen. So there's no point in uh, trialling in the patient uh, an agent which is not going to have efficacy because the patient's developed a, a resistance uh, to it, the particular cancer's not sensitive. So this offers the potential to be able to pre-weed uh, out those agents which are only likely to give rise to adverse effects. What's also exciting about these developments is that they're going to be married with all the omics technology. So the uh, high throughput capacity to sequence the tumour, uh, the capacity to understand how the genes are expressed, how the proteins are expressed, and then to understand that in the context of all the other information around the patient's response and ultimately their outcome. And when you run through these cycles many times, then the data uh, is rich uh, for making increasingly accurate predictions about response to therapy. So our laboratories uh, uh, use a variety of these uh, culture systems. And this one uh, is said to mimic the airways in, in that it creates an air-liquid interface that's typical of the, uh, the respiratory epithelium. And what it does is to encourage the differentiation. So we start with an adult epithelial stem cell. And in the right conditions, this stem cell 
generates some of the usual cell types of the airway wall. You can see uh, these purple structures, these are uh, cilia projecting out of the, the screen, and there are a variety of other cell types. And we can use this sort of uh, system for exploring viral infections, and, and this uh, happens to be an experiment looking at the rhinovirus infection of these airway epithelial cultures. And this has some currency now in the context of uh, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, and we, we were really pleased recently to observe organoids that showed the cilia on the outside. So you can see, I think, some uh, moving structures here. These are the, the fine hairs that are functioning to move the mucus. And see these are pointing outwards. Uh, and that might not seem like much, but most other people who have grown these organoids show them to be pointing inwards. And the advantage to us is that these are infectable, and so we can uh, use them to examine uh, virus infecting the, the cell in its native state rather than in an altered state uh, in a submerged uh, culture system. So that's uh, recent work from the laboratory. I've, I've taken you around this loop in terms of improving uh, structure, making models, uh, the medicinal chemist uh, making new compounds and uh, continuing to acquire information uh, with a mix of mind and machine, as it's stated here in this recent re review from the Schneiders. Um, so this is a form of machine learning, but of course there are many other forms of machine learning that are uh, coming to the fore in drug discovery and development. This is a special topic that uh, the Frontiers in Translational Pharmacology uh, journal uh, ran fairly recently, so, so it's just been uh, published for three months and already almost 30,000 uh, views. So uh, that tells us that this is uh, a very hot topic and that there are many aspects of machine learning that can impact on uh, the uh, process of drug discovery and development. So I'll just uh, briefly uh, touch on some of our own pharmacology. So this is not so much a biomedical engineering orientated, but it is uh, orientated towards understanding uh, a process uh, by which the severe asthma is resistant to treatment. So most asthma is well controlled by uh, standard drugs, the bronchodilators and, and the anti-inflammatory steroids. But severe asthma, 5% of asthmatics, but still a very significant uh, number of patients, account for more than half the cost of the disease and they continue to have symptoms despite uh, treatment with beta agonists, the relaxants and the, the anti-inflammatories. This is a whole uh, raft of ideas about why this happens, but uh, our theme over time has been that the tissue in asthma remodels and it becomes thicker. And that's uh, shown here. So here's the thickened airway uh, wall of the asthmatic and there are the profound changes in the epithelium, the lining cells that we've just been talking about. There's also profound changes in, in the muscle. And most of these changes can be attributed to, to TGF-beta-1, a cytokine, a protein that is a, an important physiological protein. It helps us to heal wounds. But if it's released inappropriately and too often, it can leave a wound uh, inappropriately in an important organ uh, like the lung or the heart or the kidneys and interfere with the functions of those uh, organs. So here it is, and it has a mechanical aspect to it. So here's a contractile cell. These are the, the contractile filaments uh, depicted in this animation. And the TGF beta has got an, an unusual pattern. It, it, it's stored in a latent form outside the cells. So when, when the uh, cell contracts, there's tension on the storage protein and it twists and the latent TGF beta uh, is released from its inactive state, uh, sequestered away from the receptors and now it can diffuse uh, towards the TGF beta receptor, engage and activate uh, that receptor and engender its various adverse consequences. Uh, and some of those are shown here. So this is, this is an experiment in, in uh, human uh, asthmatics. Uh, they were asked to inhale a constrictor substance, methicoline, and, and this just shortens the muscle. It's not thought to do any of the, the things that TGF-beta does, but it's subsequently been shown to actually release TGF-beta. 
And so one of the uh, aspects of these uh, bronchial biopsies that were taken before and after the inhalation of methacholine over a two-week period, uh, one of the aspects that changed was the amount of collagen beneath the epithelium. So you can see the collagen layer is thicker. So this is a wound-type collagen that you, you might expect to be uh, present in a, a skin injury when it, it has healed. But it's inappropriate in the airways. It makes them stiff and they uh, therefore can't dilate uh, and stretch the smooth muscle and the smooth muscle needs to be stretched periodically uh, to uh, avoid it causing the narrowing of the airways, which is the major problem in asthma. The other finding here is an increase in the, these uh, uh, very beautiful cells, the goblet cells, uh, which are able to release mucus onto the uh, cell surface. So that's uh, TGF-beta. It's a bad guy in this context. And so we were uh, very struck uh, by this set of observations uh, where we're looking at uh, an anti-inflammatory steroid and we see that just vanishingly small concentrations of TGF-beta known to be released in asthmatic uh, responses are able to ablate, to completely prevent the anti-inflammatory stimulation by this uh, and many other anti-inflammatory steroids used to treat asthma. So quite excited about this uh, finding and to cut a long story uh, short, uh, we have uh, subsequently identified that this effect of TGF-beta and uh, other effects on the formation of the wound tissue and on inflammation occur through this same enzyme, casein kinase 1 delta, uh, that is involved in the regulation of the circadian rhythm. So here's our uh, rhythm on a chip, our cells cycling through uh, their uh, rhythmic uh, period, their 24-hour circadian period, and we have uh, uh, an agent here which is able to block this circadian cycling. And uh, we're certainly interested to see uh, what it does uh, in relation to the circadian rhythm, but also what it does uh, to TGF-beta signaling. In fact, uh, that's how our interest in, in this particular clock uh, pharmacology commenced. TGF-beta is activated by different sorts of exposures, so house dust mite, uh, viral infections, mechanics, as I mentioned to you, and also air pollution, PM 2.5, that we've all been exposed to excessively over the last uh, uh, three, four months with the, uh, the bushfires. The clock has a relationship to asthma. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's a long-established uh, relationship. Here's, here's uh, Eritaeus, uh, first century treatise on asthma, eyes protuberant as if from strangulation arel uh, during the waking state, and the evil is much worse than the sleep. And actually there have been many subsequent studies that show that asthma and allergy are circadian in their intensity. Uh, the clock uh, uh, discovery, the discovery of the period protein was uh, uh, the uh, reason for the award of the Nobel Prize uh, to these gentlemen in 2017. And of course, the award of a Nobel Prize always intensifies the interest in an area of science. So, human on a chip, what are the outstanding challenges? Well, uh, I'm in awe of uh, this work by Linda Griffiths and, and her team. Uh, they've um, amassed seven microphysiological systems. So this is the coordinated preparation of cells from a number of different organs in a series of perfusion that reflects the usual connections between the organs. And so this is moving towards human on a chip. But what are the challenges? Well, there's great complexity here. There's the need for coordinated maturation of each of the microphysiological systems. And so this means there's much planning and lead time. But it's no doubt uh, daunting at present uh, to create these human on a chip uh, systems for study. Tissue chips have been to space. Uh, we were fortunate to host uh, Dan Tagle, uh, who's the director of this Tissue Chips in Space uh, program, and it, it might seem a bit indulgent to be uh, sending microphysiological systems of cells on fluidics chips into space, but there's a lot of interest in the biology that occurs in microgravity because it's known that there's accelerated ageing processes in terms of loss of muscle, skeletal muscle, loss of uh, bone mineralisation uh, in those who are subject to these 
uh, prolonged periods of microgravity. So it's hoped that sending these tissue chips into space will shed some light on that. So in, in closing, uh, I hope I've introduced you into the higher throughput, higher content measurement era, uh, given you a couple of samples of personalised uh, therapeutics and their, their potential. Uh, certainly this area of machine learning in drug discovery uh, is likely to have major impacts uh, in the next uh, decade. And an area that, that I think is very important to consider, clinical trial on a chip. I introduced the idea of an N of one clinical trial to permit individual choices of chemotherapy agents or, in fact, uh, choices not to use particular agents when the patient uh, was uh, insensitive to that agent. This all happens uh, with partnership and the ARC Centre is exceptionally uh, grateful for the continued partnership of our uh, colleagues in the industry uh, and uh, here they are and also our academic colleagues. This is a national centre with nodes at University of Western Australia and at the Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Monash University as well as National University of uh, Singapore and Swinburne uh, University which hasn't made it onto the slide yet, a recent addition to the centre. And there are also other recent additions. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our uh, local team in the Mechanopharmacology Laboratory for many of the images, including uh, this one that you see here running in the background, uh, a long-standing member of the laboratory, Trudy Harris, uh, uh, colleagues in the ARC Centre, and uh, our volunteer, Maria Belisis, that helps us uh, with some of the uh, outreach work and our many connections uh, to clinical colleagues which are absolutely crucial uh, for the appropriate clinically phenotyped uh, samples that have been used in the structures that I've shown you. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.